Warning, this show may be triggering for anybody experiencing gambling-related harm. Please watch cautiously. We speak from our experiences only. Please seek professional help for a gambling addiction. Hi, I'm Christina, and I haven't placed a bet since March of 2021. And I'm Brian, and I haven't placed a bet since July of 2014. And with us tonight is one of the original advocates, the man who wrote the book, All Bets Are Off, along with his wife, Sheila. Arnie Wexler has joined us. Arnie Wexler, thank you so much. How are you? I'm wonderful, and thank you for letting me come on with you guys. You guys are wonderful. Well, you are who we learn from, right? You're the guy who started all of this, all this advocacy from a lived experience point of view. I wouldn't say that I'm the guy that started it. When I got to GA, it was seven years uh, in existence in New York. Uh, what had happened was my wife woke me up uh, in a, a, maybe a year or two before that, and she was, she, she was uh, seeing the David Suskind show. And they had people from GA on there with bags on their head, which is a little crazy, but that's what went on in those days. It's not too far from that today, actually. So they got these people from GA talking, and I'm listening to these three people. Eventually, I got to know two of the three people. So I said to my wife, I'm not like those people. I could stop anytime I want. And she said, well, why don't you stop? I said, I don't want to stop. And a year later, I went to my first GA meeting. Um, just to just to clear that up, I wasn't referring to you being the first one to start GA or anything, but as far as using your voice to talk about your experience, to tell your story about gambling harm, you were one of the first people to do that. I would, that I would agree with you, yes. And so you know, for Christina and I, who do that on a regular basis now, it's, you know, incredible to have you on to talk about this. Absolutely. You know, I probably, well, I came to GA for a bailout, to be honest with you. Somebody told me they straighten on money problems, and I own three years annual salary. And it wasn't a secret that I gambled because every Saturday night, uh, Sheila would say, what are we going to do tonight? And I said, we go to the racetrack. And we went to Belmont. I mean, we went to Aqueduct. Jesus. We went to Roosevelt Raceway or Yonkers Raceway or Monticello Raceway. That was every Saturday night. And I went into the place where you served the food in the clubhouse area. And I got her a nice meal. And so she knew that I was gambling. Our first date was to the uh, movies. We saw a movie called Damn Yankee. And the second date was to Monticello Racetrack. She was six. 16 or 17 years old, she was wearing pigtails. And the guy said, she can't come in, she's too young. Well, I, this was our second date. And my thought was, she's gonna have to wait in the car till the races are over and I'll come out. But we went to another window and they let us in in another window. So that was our second date. And every date we had from then until we got married, uh, about a year and a half to two years later, was racetracks, a sporting event that had a bet on, uh, uh, Las Vegas nights with card games and stuff, and anything that had to do with gambling. That's what we did. So she knew I had a problem. Now we went to see the, uh, the travel agent, and I said to the travel agent, uh, how can we get to Las Vegas? And Sheila said, oh, no, we're not going to Las Vegas. <laughs> So she already, she already knew what was going on with me. And then the second choice, I thought Puerto Rico, because I knew there were a couple of casinos there. She asked the travel agent. Travel agent said, yeah, there's two casinos there. She said, we're not going there. So we went to Bermuda, where supposedly there was no gambling. So we get to Bermuda, and I find a racetrack or some kind of thing that was going on in the mountains in Bermuda, where you can bet a dollar the most you could bet is a dollar. And they had horse races where they had people, local people who had horses running their races in this mountain. And there was no seat. You sat in the hill just on the ground. So I found the racetrack the first day I was in. Second day, I was in Bermuda. The third day in Bermuda, I come down to the lobby and there's a jar of jelly beans. And it says, win a free trip to New York. Had tickets back to New York. 
the first three days of our honeymoon, I spent more time with the jelly bean jar than with Sheila. <laughs> and as you would have it, a couple that we got friendly with, he won the jelly bean contest. And, you know, the ticket was useless to me because I had the ticket to New York, but I was so pissed off that he won. And I didn't. And we had our first fight in the balcony in the hotel about the gambling and stuff. And I had bet a horse in the Kentucky in the Kentucky Derby and it lost. And I bet the same horse in the Bel in the Preakness and it lost. And it was racing in the Belmont Stakes when we were on our honeymoon. And I didn't put a bet because I decided I was never going to gamble again. And the horse won and paid something like $143 in the Belmont Stakes, 1968. And again, I was very pissed off. You know, why did I get married instead of have this bet? And that's how our, our life started. And we went through seven years of that kind of nonsense. And now a word from our sponsor, Gamban.com. Go to Gamban.com to check out their blocking software to block gambling from your phone, your tablet, or your computer, or even your telegraph or typewriter. Gamban.com. Now back to our program. Okay, I was going to ask you because I, I read your book, um, of course, and it, it's very it's very interesting both perspectives. Like your your perspective as as the gambler and her perspective, and how differently you each saw things. Because you talk about you know um, not being in love or thinking you weren't in love in the beginning, and she was talking about how magical everything was, and it it was very interesting to me to see the different perspectives, but. Uh, I think you might've answered it, but how long was like your, your ad addictive gambling um, while, while you like, how long were you in the gambling your life? Well, I started gambling at age seven or eight years old and it was flipping baseball cards, shooting marbles, pitching pennies and that kind of stuff. And then I got a, I became a bookmaker in, in junior high school because they, it was a thing that was going around in those days. You pick three baseball players, and if they got three hits, but they got six hits between them, you won a dollar. So you invest 10 cents, you win a dollar. And I was bookmaking that stuff in junior high school. So my gambling history goes way back. I was 14 years old, and I was working in the garment center, and I was making 50 cents an hour, and a girl in the building that I lived in, my father and her father were friends. And she was going to the rate track one Saturday night. And she said, would you like to go with me? I said, sure. So I was uh, I was 14 or 15 years old and I went to the racetrack with her and they let me in. And I won uh, a horse paid $54. I had the horse and I won, I don't know, 50 or $60 for the night. And I thought I was going to be a millionaire. And that night, and it was September 26th, happened to be my birthday. And what had happened was I thought to myself, what an easy way to make money. I could be a millionaire from gambling. By the time I'm 30, I'm going to be a millionaire. And that hooked me that day. I was dead in the water at that point. So I met Sheila. No, I went out with two girls before Sheila. And I took them both to the racetrack and I lost both times. So I said, girls are bad luck. And I never went out with another girl until I met Sheila. And I met her up in the Catskill Mountains. So uh, that's our story, how we met. And for seven years, I had it totally crazy. I mean, the things that went on in our house were unbelievable. There were no cell phones. Transistor radios had just come out. There were no credit cards except Diners Club. So it was not easy to get money. I was a plant manager working for a biggest dress company in America, a company called Jonathan Logan. And I was their plant manager. And I was stealing every day to support my gambling addiction. And anybody that came in to sell me a product, plastic bags, hangers, trucking, anything, I had to get a kickback in cash. So I was making about five or 6,000 a year. And I was getting other monies coming in, probably 20 or 30,000 a year. So it was like I was a millionaire in those days. Nobody made more than 10. 10 if you made $10,000 in the 60s, you were like a millionaire. 
And uh, I bought a car. One, some of the incidents that happened, I bought a car from somebody. And then one day I was trying to place a bet and the bookmaker said, Arnie, you owe me some money. If you don't pay me, you can't make a bet tonight. So I took the car and I sold it for $500. It was a 1961 or 63 Chevy. Sold it for $500 cash to my neighbor upstairs, paid the bookmaker what I owed him, and I got back into action. And I left Sheila in the house with no car and a baby. And some of the things that developed, I mean, Sheila would say to me, she would want to have sex sometimes. And I, you know, who gave a damn about sex? I only was interested in gambling. So I would do her a favor. And I remember one incident that happened. We're having sex and I got the transistor radio under my pillow and I'm listening to a ball game that I got to bet on. And Sheila says, I think I hit a ball game. And I said, you're crazy. But that's, you know, gambling. I ate, slept and drank gambling. Gam nothing else mattered in my life. I mean, nothing. Sheila would go to up to the Catskill Mountains in New York with her, with her mother and father for the summer. And I would leave North Bergen, New Jersey, which was about a two hour trip to Monticello up there because every night they had racetrack open in Monticello. And I drive up every day. I'd leave the, the job a little early and drive to Monticello. And every night I'd pick her up and we'd go to the racetrack. And that went on for about four or five summers till I came to GA. And then I'd wake up at four in the morning and come back to North Bergen to get back to my job. And things that went on were just unbelievable, the stuff that happened to us. I remember we had our first child. Well, Sheila was in, in the hospital having labor. And the doctor said, you have plenty of time. So I dumped her in the hospital and I went to the racetrack that night. And I came back the next morning and the doctor said, you have plenty of time. I went to the afternoon racetrack in New York. Same thing went on when I came back again. And that night I went to Yonkers or Roosevelt, I don't remember which. And then the next morning I went to the hospital and she had the baby. And the doctor, Sheila had given me a bunch of dimes. In those days it was a dime to place a, a call in the phone booth, in the, you know, the public phones. So I uh, had a bunch of dimes. And when we had the baby, I was gonna call everybody in the family. So, the doctor comes out and he says, you have a baby. I didn't ask how my, how my baby was. I didn't ask how my wife was. I said, doc, how much does she weigh? He said, seven pounds, one ounce. I ran to the, to the phone booth with the dimes. And the first person I called was the bookmaker. And I bet, I said, Maddie, seven and one in the daily double tonight. I want to bet $10. And I bet it. And as luck would have it, the daily double came in and I won a couple of hundred dollars. And now I was sure that God was sending me this message that I could be a winner because look what just happened. And I was locked in again and that happened. So that's a, some of the stuff that went on. Then we try to have a, a second child and this went on for about two years. And, you know, in the shape I was, nothing was happening and Sheila was in the same shape. And later on, I found out that Sheila said, she wanted to kill herself because she was living in the gambling stuff with me. And I had $5,000 worth of insurance. And I thought if I killed myself, she could collect the $5,000 insurance. And both of us were thinking the same thing, but we never spoke, so we didn't know. So Sheila came to me one time. She wanted to adopt the baby, and the baby was going to be born in Florida. And you needed $5,000. I didn't have five cents. So I went to borrow money from my mother, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law's mother. I, I put together $5,000 to get the, the baby to, to us. And we went down to Florida to pick up the baby. And I never saw the baby for five days until he was ready to be picked up and go on the airplane to come home. Because I went to the high lie, I went to the racetrack, I was at all kinds of gambling stuff, and I never even went to the hospital to see the baby. And the day we went to pick him up, it was the fifth day, and it was the seventh game of the World Series, and I had a bet on the World Series, and I'm in the plane, and the pilot 
every minute is every inning is giving you the score of the game. And Sheila is sitting there holding this beautiful little boy we just adopted. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I wish somehow this plane would get to the ground so I could listen and see the ball game live. I mean, that's the sickness that was going on in my crazy head. And that's really what went on. It was seven years of horror. It's amazing that Sheila didn't, that Sheila survived what was going on. I thought I was sick and crazy, but she was just as crazy or even more. And uh, I remember one time she called me up. I borrowed $5,000 from my boss and I was paying him $25, $25 a week back. And I would, all of a sudden, I stopped bringing home the paycheck stub. I would cash the check and bring it home to her. And, you know, I'd bring cash. And then she, somehow she ended up calling, I don't know how this happened, but she ended up calling the IRS office and found out my salary and how much money I'm supposed to net and bring home. And she figured out I was $25 short every week. So I told her, look, Everybody in the factory, and there's 500 people working in the factory. You listen to this one, you won't believe it. I tell her the Wells Fargo order comes to the, uh, to the outside of the factory, and everybody gets cash. Can you imagine all those people lining up waiting to get cash? And she bought it. And what, ha what happened after that, it was just getting worse and worse. There was all kinds of stories and stuff going on. Uh, it, it was just a horror. And it, uh, it continued and continued and continued until somebody told me that GA straightens out money problems. And I went to GA for that reason, never to stop gambling, but just went there for a bailout. And I was there three weeks with a fake name and a fake phone number. And on the third week, somebody said, we give people a pressure relief meeting. And I said, what is that? They said, it's like we work out a budget. So in my sick mind, I thought they were going to pay off my gambling debts. So I went along with the idea, but they said, you have to bring your wife. And she was going to go to Gaminon. So I went home that night and I told Sheila about it. And we came to GA and Gaminon. And a couple of weeks later, they gave me a pressure relief meeting with Sheila. And they looked at everything. And I'm really happy that they're going to give me the money. And they said to me, uh, you need two more jobs. So I knew these people were crazy and there was nothing in GA for me at that point. So I came on, uh, my first meeting was February 10th, 1968. And the pressure relief meeting was March, I don't know, 4th or 5th, if I remember right. And then April 10th was opening day of the baseball season. And I decided that I could go on a winning streak. So I bet opening day of the baseball season. First game I bet with Bob Gibson and the Cardinals and he won the game two nothing. And the money was going on to the Mets and the Giants in the second game. In the bottom of the ninth inning, the Giants scored, I believe four runs and I blew the game. And that was my last bet, thank God. So that's, that's the story how I ended up in GA, but my ego, you know, I always felt like I was here and everybody else was up there. My whole life I felt like that. Now I come to GA and they tell me it's three weeks after I stopped gambling, they said they have an intergroup meeting. And I didn't know what that was. I went to the intergroup meeting. I was three weeks clean. And they said they need somebody to answer the telephones. I raised my hand. I'm answering the telephones. Three weeks clean. I couldn't tell you toilet paper from compulsive gambling. And I'm answering the phones. Two guys stayed in GA. One guy is still in GA today. And the other one died a couple of years ago. He was in GA 30 years before he died. So you never know. And then all of a sudden I became, in my mind, I became a, a different person because now I was doing something. And I went from not feeling like this to feel better. And I got involved in GA and it took me till September of that year. So we're talking another six or seven months to really buy in that I was a compulsive gambler. I still thought that I was gonna go back to gambling. I still thought that I could win at gambling. I, I didn't really buy into the program. Well, my wife was going to gammon on and it was the same night as the GA meeting. And I basically had to go with her because how would it look, you know? So I went 
And then on September 26th, it was my birthday, and we went to, I was invited to Greenhaven Prison to talk at the GA meeting in the prison in upstate New York. And that day, I saw women and kids kiss, kiss their fathers through a mesh fence. And it affected me, but when I got home, I still thought I could go gamble and be okay. And Sheila and I and another couple were in the house till four o'clock in the morning until finally Sheila said, here's $20. I don't remember if she said 20 or whatever it was. She's, here's money, go gamble, I don't give a shit. And all of a sudden it hit me and that's, it took me six or seven months in GA to really understand that I was a compulsive gambler and I needed help and I had to stop. But I was involved in the program. I was the PR man for New York in that time when I still didn't even believe about GA. So the involvement in GA made me stay in the program and be okay at that point. And then a couple of years later, I was invited to be one of the people that started National Council on Compulsive Gambling with Monsignor Dunn. And there were 15 of us at that time. There's only two of us left today that I'm aware of. Myself and my friend, Joe G, who saved my life the first 10 years I was in GA. And after 10 years, Joe G left GA. And Joe lives in Las Vegas today. And he's been gambling for the last 45 years. And he's on his third wife. And he's the greatest guy in the world. I love him. The last time he was at a meeting, I was in Las Vegas to do a seminar. It had to be 10 years ago, and I took him to a GM meeting. But this guy saved more people and helped more people, and he's been out there for 45 years now. Well, I, I'm kind of curious about Joe, the way you phrased that. But Joe saved people, but Joe couldn't save himself? What happened was Joe was he was a trustee, and I was a trustee. And Joe was uh, 10 years in the program, and he was, he was a giant in GA in New York. And like I said, he was one of the founders of National Council also. And what happened was Joe lost his job. He worked in, a, in the uh, stock market, and he lost his job. And when he lost his job, something happened to his mind. Mm. He started becoming a bookmaker, and he, he started working for the mob, and he, he was bookmaking at the racetrack. And he was doing all kinds of stuff to raise money. And his wife eventually left him. Then he was married to another lady. <laughs> he was married to a lady that was, uh, I believe she was a singer in, in California someplace. And they got married and she didn't know about his gambling. And they went on a honeymoon after a, a couple of months. They went on a honeymoon to Reno. And he started gambling the way I heard the story. And went upstairs and took some money for her pocketbook and uh, she he, he, she divorced him. She left him and divorced him. And he's married now to a third lady who's a fabulous lady. I love them both so much. And I speak to Joe every couple of weeks and we, I love the guy and I wish I could get him back to GA. Yeah, they have to want it more for themselves than we want it for them, right? Yeah. Um, I do have, have a question though. Uh, you've talked about your story and, and how, how you got to GA and how, how the council started, which we're all so grateful for. Um, what, what all, since you started recovery, you started GA, you, um, you know, started going to GA and then you started the councils. What has your life been like? Like, I know you've done, you've done so many things. You're so involved. Uh, you were even on Oprah, right? Yeah. Well, I got a call one day from Oprah's producer, and she said, we want to do female gambling, uh, gamblers. So I got her a female gambler, and I was in New Jersey. They did a videotape with me. I wasn't on in the show live, but it was a videotape, and it came on the show. Yeah, I did that one. I did a bunch of stuff over the years in PR. I've done Howard Tosell. I've done uh, Richard Brooks, who made the movie uh, about the gambler. And, you know, I've done a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, help, <clears throat> helping people, uh, the only people that I see stay in GA are the people that stick their hand out to help other people. The people that just come to meetings and sit there and go home, they disappear after a while. But the people that get involved, 
they're having a, they're having a meeting next week. Oh, no, April. I think April first, if I remember right. And it's going to be all the people that have fifty years or more. There's sixteen people right now that we know of that have fifty years or more. And there's going to be sixteen of us on this show on this uh, on this meeting because the guy that's celebrating the most year, Bill B from New York, sixty years. He's celebrating, and we're all going to be on with him. So I'm anxious to see that one. But uh, I don't know. I've seen more people leave GA than stay in GA, and it's a shame. And do you think that has a lot to do with um, which we we will respectfully approach the subject? But the fact that that GA um, does not advertise, it's very still very hush hush. I mean, I believe that there are people that that need to keep their anonymity for work reasons or, or whatever. Um, but do you feel like if, if they had been more open in, in the beginning, um, that maybe things would be different in the recovery community for those struggling with gambling? You know, I'm not sure about anything to an answer to that, but I can tell you I've had interventions with a guy who has a bunch of Super Bowl rings a guy that was a major league baseball player, top-notch player. I've had a basketball player that played in the NBA that started playing about 17 or 18 years old that his agent called me to help him. I've had uh, politicians. I had a guy who was a Senate, uh, a uh, speaker of an assembly in a state. So I've had a bunch of those guys. And, you know, for some reason, some of them are afraid to go to GA meetings. They don't want people to know. But it's okay. People see them gambling and doing all kinds of crap in casinos, but they're afraid to go to a GA meeting. So that is one of the issues. I've had people tell me that I started the 800 gambler number and we put it in. We forced the casinos in Atlantic City to put it in. Now that number's in a lot of places throughout the country. And what had happened then was uh, we had a huge fight with the Casino Control Commission and the gambling people. I remember one of the gambling uh, presidents said to me, you could get it in, but we'll get it out soon. It has never come out. It's still been in there. And we get a lot of people call. I have a number called 888 Last Bet. I get a lot of calls on that one too. But the fact is that it's such a hidden organ, such a hidden thing. You know, people that have alcohol or drug addiction, you see it, you smell it, you know it. You could be a compulsive gambler, and it could be so hidden. You know, you're, you're in a suit, a lady's in a nice dress, she has a nice job, she goes to work, a guy could ha be the president of a company, all kinds of stuff. I, I had one case of a guy who was a vice president of a casino that came for help. And I, one time I did a workshop, and it's funny, I think it was in Oklahoma, and a lady came to me and said, that she's a compulsive gambler, but she works in a casino and in the uh, the uh, change room or whatever you call that, where people make change and stuff. And she can't tell anybody. And her husband wants a divorce and I got her into GA. So, you know, there's some amazing people that I've met over the years that were compulsive gamblers. And some of them are afraid to come to meetings because God forbid somebody should find out they're a compulsive gambler. I've had bankers and you name it. That's one issue. The other issue that it's so hidden and invisible. I remember one lady calling me from New Brunswick, New Jersey. And she said, my husband's a compulsive gambler. I said, when did you find out? She said, two weeks ago when he was arrested by the police, the state police, because he worked for an insurance company. He stole 40 or $50,000. She said, I never knew he gambled. We were married 30 years. And it can be that hidden and invisible. It wasn't in my case, but in some cases it is. Arnie, um, talking, what do you think it is about meetings? Maybe not specifically GA, but about meetings that helps people stop gambling and find recovery? That's a real interesting question. I'm not sure what works. The only thing that I, no, I shouldn't say I know, you know, when, when you're in the throes of gambling, you think that you're the only one living and doing this kind of stuff. Now you come to me, I'm talking for myself. 
Now I come to a meeting and I see there's a bunch of other people living like I did, did it doing the things I did, behaving the way I did. And I figured out that I'm not alone. So that helped me. The other thing, for the first three years, Sheila was very pissed off to the point that, and later she talked about it after three years, she told me she wanted to get even with me for all the stuff I did the first seven years. So what had happened was she was very angry, very pissed off. If I would say, I'm going to take the kid to the park, what right do you have to take the kid to the park? You didn't care for seven years. You know, and it was that kind of life we had for, for the first three years anyways. And to the point that uh, it was such craziness going on in our house. I was working three jobs. And when I got home, I was so tired, I fell asleep. I never did anything except being involved in GA and working. And I didn't even know she was that pissed off and that angry. And one day at an open meeting, a guy said to me, how do you live with that bitch? Had no idea that she was even angry. So she wasted three years of being angry and I had no clue because we never had conversation. We didn't talk, nothing was going on. And that's really what happened. And you didn't notice it. No, I didn't, I didn't know. If, if people didn't tell me, I didn't know because I, I was never home. My head wasn't into it. I was, I was tired all the time sleeping. And I was the only, the only thing that I did with my kids when I was gambling, well, I actually only had, I had uh, two kids in the house at that point. I would take the kids in the carriage and I would go to the park. And I would go to the park because there was a payphone. There were no cell phones in those days. So I'd go to the park, go to the payphone, call the bookmaker, take the kid a walk in the park and come back home. And that's how I had to do my action. Today, people can, uh, can do it on the phone. You can do it on the computer. You can, you can go to the bathroom and use the cell phone. I mean, it's just crazy what goes on today. In those days, it was a little hard to be able to be a compulsive gambler. Today, it's easy. Very true. Um, I'm going to ask this one question that I'm going to let Brian bring it home. Um, out of, okay, so you're going to be 54 years in recovery coming April up in 10, April? April 10, 54 years. Yeah, which is absolutely amazing. In those 54 years, did complacency ever pop up for you? There have been times, I'm going to say the first 10 years in GA, there was complacency, there was lying. Uh, the biggest thing, I couldn't stop lying. And I don't know how many years into it. It might have been six. It might have been 10. I'm not sure. So one day, Sheila asked me a question, and I throw her the answer. And then I said, do me a favor. Ask me the question again. And that was the first time I told the truth. And I don't remember. It was years into the program. I don't remember how long. And that's the first time I stopped lying. I was, lying was so inherent my whole life that I didn't know how to tell the truth. Interesting. Um, even a year in recovery, I'm still kind of having to rewire my brain to just not even do like little white lies, you know, because I, uh, I personally gambled for 12 years and uh, there towards the end, it was just like lie after lie after lie. And you, it's interesting how you have to retrain your brain, even the smallest lie, like, you know, just the simplest thing that you don't even have to lie about. But sometimes it's just like an automatic lie because you don't want to deal with confrontation or you don't want to deal with with whatever the result of the answer would be and so that was um, something I really had to deal with early on I'm, I'm saying I'm pretty good with it now but um, Sheila, early on Sheila would, Sheila would say to me what did you have for lunch and I have Chinese food and I tell her I had a hot dog and I know exactly what you're talking about because I would lie about things you didn't have to lie about but yeah and it's, you know, this is such a complicated disease. Uh, I'm now hearing all this stuff. Of, you know, here's another interesting thing. Parkinson's meds are creating compulsive gamblers. And you would think there'd be some federal research studying this and figuring out what this has to do with compulsive gambling. But I know a bunch of people with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease that have this addiction. One situation, I was working in a treatment center and a guy comes in and the owner of the treatment center says, this guy is nuts. And I have an individual meeting with him. And he tells me, 
he's on Parkinson's meds and I knew all about it. So I go back to the owner of the place and I tell him, you know, this is a legit thing. And there's a lot of people have it. And I went to the computer and I showed him how many cases I, I saw. And Sheila ran a treatment center for a bunch of years and she found some of that also. So the, this compulsive gambling stuff is very tricky. And I love what you said about rewiring your brain because that's really the case. Our brains get all tangled up with the gambling stuff. And I never understood this until all the stuff I'm reading recently. There's so much stuff coming out about this. It's amazing. Well, Arnie, uh, the book is All Bets Are Off, written by Arnie and his wife, Sheila. Um, and I, people can read the book and get your story. And, and that I, I want to ask two questions to wrap up. And the first is, of course, words of wisdom for anybody still struggling with a gambling addiction is my first question. You cannot recover on your own. If you think you can recover on your own, I tried this 20 times. I would go to the racetrack, bet small bets, then do big bets, then do small bets. I would go to the racetrack instead of betting number one, I bet number eight. I did all kinds of shenanigans to try to control my gambling, and I wasn't able to do it, and nobody is. The only way you can stop gambling is get hooked up with somebody else that has the same problem. That's been my experience anyways, and that you could help each other. Otherwise, it, it, you can't do it yourself. You try you a million ways. It just don't work. And my last question for the benefit of myself and Christina and uh, what is turning out to be sort of a generation of people who are entering recovery who want to talk about their addiction uh, because either talking helps or because they feel it's important to share their story to help other people. You're the guy who did that, right? You're the guy. So what kind of wisdom can you share with us, those of us who want to make a difference, who want to see an end to gambling harm? What can you tell us? What's the magic sauce? It's funny when you say that, because let me tell you, we move, in, we move from Queens to New Jersey, and we move to a development in Sayable, New Jersey. And Sheila says to me, look, we just moved here. Don't start with talking about the gambling to the neighbors. <laughs> and the first guy comes by and he says, uh, we have a poker game every Wednesday night. Would you like to join us? So I had to tell him. And I've had a bunch of experiences like that, you know, situations like that. So, you know, I've always been open about it. Uh, it's rare that you find some people like that. I'm going to get you some ladies that do that today to speak with you guys. But it's a hidden illness and people are so ashamed and so embarrassed. And, you know, you're a businessman or you're or you're a lady that has a nice job or you you have a nice home with children in the house. And there's no smell, there's no track marks, like I said before. It's so hidden that... Sometimes people wouldn't believe you were a compulsive gambler, have any kind of issue. There's nothing seen. You're not beating up your wife. You're not, the police are not coming because you did something wrong. All of a sudden there's an embezzlement, a white collar crime, then somebody finds out. But it drives me crazy that people will not discuss this thing in public. And that, this, you know, I had an 80 year old lady walk into a meeting last year, two years ago, three years ago, maybe. And I said, how did you find out about GA? She said, my daughter told me. She said, I never heard of it before. And it makes me crazy when I hear stuff like that. And by the way, the book, the only book that ever came out where the spouse of a gambler shares her story. There are so many women. I'm, I'm on one site where it's a women, uh, women that are living with women that are, are wives of compulsive gamblers. And you, you read the stories there, it's horrible what goes on. But it's so hidden, it's so invisible. Nobody understands it or knows it. Makes me crazy. Us too. Yeah. Well, Arnie Wexler, thank you so much for joining us on The Bet Free Life. You are the OG of Share Your Story. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for what you've done for us and for everybody else. It's just a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you guys so much. You know, that's my motive. My, my motive is always to 
get the message out because there's so many people suffering and have no idea there's help. Thank you. And now, now it's even crazier. You, you put on a ball game, you put on uh, radio, whatever you put on all day long, you got ads for gambling. It's crazy. Yeah. The, the government, yeah. the government is going nuts. Uh, I see New York State is getting 51% of the profit of the losses of gamblers. That is asinine. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank you for thank saying you guys that. So much. Uh, for Christina, I'm Brian. This is the Bet Free Life. Talking helps. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.